So good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for joining us uh, for this webinar with Universitat Bocconi. Uh, my name is Mark Huntington. I am the managing director of an organization called A Star Future, uh, which basically tries to encourage British students to go and study anywhere but the UK uh, to investigate all of the good options they have around Europe and further afield. Uh, we're delighted that this evening we're going to be focusing exclusively on one of the most popular choices for British educated students in recent years, and that is obviously Universita Bocconi. And you're going to hear from representatives of the university, as well as three of their current students who went through the same journey that presumably you're just about to embark on. So we will introduce them as and when we go through. Uh, but the first person you're going to hear from tonight is Mario Tabarini, who is the head of guidance and uh, recruitment at the university. And he's going to just really introduce the university to you so that you understand a bit more about Bocconi and what it has to offer. So thanks, Mario. Over to you. Thanks so much, Mark. Mark and welcome, welcome, everybody tonight. Uh, and thanks for, for being with us. I'm going to share my screen. I have a short presentation. Um, so my name is Mario Tabarini. I'm in charge of the guidance and recruitment team here at the university. Uh, so Bocconi. Uh, Bocconi was born in 1902, so quite recent for Italian standards. We have the oldest university in the world, Bologna, in, in the year 1088, I think. And so, but Bocconi was the first university ever in Italy uh, granting a degree in economics and, and commerce. So that leading position in the area of social science has been maintained throughout the years. For many years, we've been the only university in Italy granting that degree. And we have focused on those, on those disciplines and uh, we've been doing quite well throughout the years. So we are also very much international. We started our exchange programs in 1974. So 13 years before the Erasmus program, which was created in 1987, we created the first uh, bachelor program fully taught in English in Italy ever in 2001, uh, Bachelor of International Economics and, Economics and Management, and Management, which is still existing. And we, and we have an incredible network of partner universities. Uh, as of this year, we have 286 partner universities all over the world, all the top institution basically in any place. So we combine the quantity and the quality. The university is mid size we're about 15,000 students. As I said before, we don't do every discipline. We don't know, we, we're not a multi-faculty university. We're very much focused on social sciences. And then I'll talk about our degrees. And we are very international also because the nationalities on campus are over a hundred. And in the courses taught in English, which you will see in a few minutes, are the majority of courses that we offer fully taught in English. Uh, we, are, we have reached 41% of students who are not in Italian, who doesn't have an Italian nationality, an Italian passport. Uh, this 41%, if we take only the first year intake, this year is going up to 48%. So our goal is to have 50% 50, 50, 50 of class Italian and 50% international. We are very well positioned within any basically international ranking that you may uh, have heard about from QS to Financial Times and so on and so forth. And basically our positioning is among the top 20 in the world in these disciplines and top three, top five in Europe. If we consider only uh, continental Europe, we in some cases we're number one, like in the business and management uh, QS uh, rankings of, the, of 2020, 2021. So our undergraduate school, which is the school where all our bachelors are actually offered, uh, we have uh, around uh, 8,000 students. And uh, we, from basically all over the places, of course, uh, Europe is the main, uh, the main place where our students are coming from. It counts for about two thirds. This includes uh, also Italy, of course, but we have a good uh, representation from Asia and Oceania and from the Americas a bit less from Africa, but we're increasing that number, the number two. Uh, uh, you may uh, want to, to know that in the recent years, Bocconi has gained lots of uh, um, additional, let's say, uh, recognition worldwide uh, because of the quality of our education, the quality of our research, the quality of our uh, programs. And, uh, and, and, and we have increased the number of applicants. To give you one single number, uh, this year we have, we have had an increase of 52% from uh, international candidates only. 
for the bachelors. So we have increased all the targets, but the bachelor international have increased really a lot. Uh, we have, uh, we offer different bachelors. You can see we offer basically eight, <coughs> eight bachelors uh, and three of them have also an Italian version. All of them are in English, basically. We go from economics and management, which is our management course, uh, I would like to say so, to the international economics and finance, where you have two parts. One is finance and one is more economics, mainly international economics. And then we have an, another management course, which is management for arts, culture, and communication, very country specific to Italy, uh, very much requested by the, the, the job market, not only in Italy, but all over the places, managers who can speak the language of culture, creative industries, and so on and so forth. And they are very much, uh, let's say, uh, appreciated by, by the market. Then we have a politics and government course, politics course. Then we have economics and social sciences. This is economics course, pure economics, um, pretty much quantitative. But the most two quantitative courses are the economics management and computer science and the mathematical and computer sciences for artificial, for artificial intelligence. These two, these two courses are new kits in the, in the offer. Uh, mathematical and computing sciences for artificial intelligence was uh, for the first time last year <coughs> and economics management and computer sciences in 2017. So we had our first graduates in, uh, in 2020. So we have basically, uh, in, uh, we have basically these two courses who are very much requested by the job market, uh, meaning that companies want people who can speak, who can be good managers uh, can be good economists, but also can speak the language of data science and artificial intelligence. Then we have our flagship program, which is the World Bachelor in Business. This is a program created in 2013, a unique case in the history of higher education. So uh, a single, let's say, program grants three, which grants three degrees in three different continents. So you spend the first year at the University of Southern California, the Marshall School of Business, top thanks top 10 ranked always among the undergraduate business programs in the US. Second year in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, the business school, again, top three, top four in Asia. And the third year in Milano at Bocconi. The fourth year, you, you, uh, you take it where you prefer. So it's a four year program. Why is it differentiated from the others? Because all the others are three years program. Because in Italy, by law, you have a three years bachelor degree. So the four year program, with, with the, these three universities, uh, grants three degrees in three different continents and open, us, and open up to three different job markets. And of course, we have three courses taught in Italian, basically the same discipline that you find uh, the equivalences in the English offer. How is our bachelor program structure? So the first year basically is the, almost the same for every, for every degree, not exactly the same going from management to uh, math for, for AI, but very, very, very much similar. So we have compulsory courses and then we have computer science. We don't want to teach Python in the first year to grant a bit of programming for everybody, which is now necessary for any, any, any job you may want to, to, to pursue. And then uh, the first language, first foreign language, and then one critical thinking uh, webinar and a seminar. And this is another, this is another very relevant part. The, the so-called soft skills that you explore in the first year from already from the first year, then you continue to do it in the second year are very relevant for, for us. There's been a LinkedIn survey a couple of years ago saying that the soft, asking all the manager, if, uh, managers if it was more important the hard skills or the soft skills. And it came out that the soft skills are considered more important by, by managers and by companies. So really soft skills are crucial. You want to be a good, a very good uh, specific specialist of the matter that you study, but also you want to uh, be good in uh, working with others, doing uh, team working, uh, doing uh, uh, critical uh, thinking, uh, leadership skills and all that stuff. Second year more focused on, 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 the, on, the, on your bachelor. And then the third year you do the electives, you do the internship, you do an exchange program and you do the final thesis. So really, really a very, very compact, but very, very nice program. Uh, we have a very good placement. We, we were born by, 
uh, we were funded by an entrepreneur, Mr. Bocconi, who decided to put his money on education. It was in the textile industry, which is in Milano, something that is very relevant here, the fashion capital. Uh, and, you know, we had that in, that in our DNA. So the relationship with the companies allows us to have a very, a very incredible placement. Uh, these data are from the masters, first of all, because the 95% of the students taking a, a bachelor at Bocconi do apply for a master at Bocconi. Then we don't take all of them, but we take a very good group. Uh, but this means that uh, basically nobody's working after the bachelor, um, only a few, a very small percentage. So this, that is why the statistics we provide are on the masters. And these statistics say that 93.6% of uh, graduates are employed one year after graduation, 75% on the day of graduation, and 32% uh, of the student, 33% nearly, are uh, employed abroad. This 93.6 was calculated is the 2020 data. So can you imagine 2020 has been an incredibly uh, a normal year, I would say. So uh, usually this percentage goes up uh, up to 20, 90, 96%. So it's really uh, that every Bocconi student have different um, offers, job offers and find a job. Very, very easy. Our campus, uh, Milano and Bocconi. So our campus is basically downtown Milano, 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes walking from the main square, which is the Duomo of Milano. And it's very lively. You have a really incredible number of activities do, uh, every day. Uh, we have uh, all, uh, we have 200 plus uh, uh, events organized by our students in addition to the events organized by the university. Uh, our student associations are very active. There are associations in everything you may think of from sports to music, to theater, to politics, to economics and so on and so forth. We have TV, Bocconi uh, TV, Bocconi uh, magazine, Bocconi radio run by students. So really, and guest speakers. We had Anna Winter a couple of weeks ago, last year opening of the academic year was Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen. So really, really and not to mention that our new brand new sports center. So in the middle of the city, you have a campus. In the middle of the campus, you have a brand new building, which was uh, inaugurated last year. Uh, uh, winner, prize winners for, for, of many, many really architectural prizes uh, designed by a group of Japanese architects. So very modern, it was in my first slide. And uh, within this, this new part of campus, new building, there is a, a very nice sports center with an Olympionic swimming pool indoor in the middle of the city, which is kind of unique in Europe, I would say. Also, we have uh, housing, uh, 2,000 rooms is indoors, all of them walking distance from the campus, and we, we're going to increase the number of places also next year, but this is not really an issue for, uh, for, um, uh, for, our, for our school. So I think I will stop here for this part of the presentation, Mark. Thank you very much, Mario. That gives everybody there an insight as to exactly what bachelor's programs are available and what facilities there are there, including the new Olympic swimming pool, of course, that was going to have to be mentioned at some point. Um, but one thing I should have said at the beginning, for all of you watching this, uh, this is about your questions uh, as much as it is us providing you with information. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom to put in there anything that you are interested in, directed to either Mario and Elisa at the university or to our three students here. Um, but I am going to take this opportunity to be the first person to ask a question of Mario. And this one is related to the situation which I fa we find ourselves right now. You did address this a little bit already, um, but my question relates more to what are students finding when they come into Bocconi and how are you helping them out the other end? In terms of what is the student experience looking like? You mentioned pretty good employability stats there for your master's students. How have you been able to manage that when everything's shut? This has been a big challenge, uh, but as, as always, uh, challenge is also an opportunity, uh, some, some, some opportunities. So I think the pandemic hit everybody and everybody had to cope with it. The universities all over the world had to reshape their way of uh, doing teaching. And 
so one big big thing here that is that Bocconi wants to grant a degree in person. So uh, we don't offer online degrees, and it's not in the, the rather for for the next next few years at the bachelor level. So we do have all the technologies to provide online teaching, and we did it basically uh, during the pandemic, and we're doing it right now. I mean, the courses are physical, so students are on campus, on class, but at the same time they uh, they attend classes in, in they attend part of classes, they do things online uh, because we use the technologies in order to help out the teaching that we have. And of course, if there are any problem in any moment, uh, any, anything will move, we move online. We moved 427 courses in two days in February, end of February 2020, because Italy was the first hit, first Western country hit by the pandemic then. So we really cope with that. And it, this is valid also with the internship. We offer this year uh, over 9,000 internships to our students. This year, meaning 2020, uh, 9,000 internships to our students uh, compared to the usual 11,000. So a bit of a drop, but not that much. 9,000 offers meaning that every student has received uh, five to six offers in, in six months or seven months. So we go with that, uh, considering that we do value very much the face-to-face -face and the possibility also for the students to do internship uh, physically and, and not online. But of course, we have to face this and get the most from the opportunities we have there. You are muted, Mark. I am indeed. Sorry, you caught me out a little bit there. Thanks, Mario. So yes, pandemic has changed a few things. Um, but, you know, in terms of getting you into employment, it does sound that, you know, the internship opportunities that are such a critical part of life at Bocconi weren't too badly affected by that. So thank you very much, Mario. Now, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce our three students, by which I mean get them to introduce themselves. Um, and they're going to talk a little bit about who they are, where they came from in the UK, why it is they went to Bocconi, just very, very briefly. And then... We will hear from Elisa, who's going to go through all the nuts and bolts, all those questions you're going to have about IB requirements, say, you know, SATs, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to get to that. That's Elisa's job. And then after that, all of the questions that you put into the Q&A, we are going to direct to the most appropriate person. But for now, I would like to invite, in no particular order, uh, Georgia, please, if you could just say a few words about who you are. Yes, hi everyone, nice to see so many people, and um, thanks Mark and Mario. Um, so my name is Giorgia, um, as you can tell from my name, I am Italian um, by origin, both my parents are, but I grew up in uh, the UK, um, in high school I did my GCSEs in um, grammar school in South West London called Diffin Girls, and then for sixth form I moved uh, to Wales to study at an international boarding school called UWC Atlantic. Um, I'm now in my second year of a uh, bachelor studying the economic and social science course, uh, which I've enjoyed a lot. Um, I did apply also to study in the UK and I would have done PPE. However, I was interested in the more quantitative course that the social science course um, offered and also the, the possibility to study abroad in Italy. And um, even though I'm from there, it's my, my first time here and I really enjoyed it. And um, also applying, I accepted my offer during the pandemic and um, the way that Bocconi handled the whole situation, I was really great, like, grateful to have studied here as um, it meant that we could study here the whole time, uh, even when, yeah, the, the situation in the UK wasn't as, uh, as great for a lot of my, my classmates. Um, and I think I'll leave it at this. Okay, thanks very much, Georgia. Uh, Felix, if I could ask you to say roughly the same about you and your experiences. Hi, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, my name is Felix Reimnitz. Um I uh, applied to Bocconi from uh, King's College School, which is in Wimbledon. Um, I applied with my IB as well as SAT. And um, I applied in the early session. So, I mean, uh, that was one of the main reasons why I chose to go to Bocconi is because I applied a year beforehand. I got pretty much an unconditional offer. Um, and it meant that regardless of my UCAS applications, I was, and regardless of my IB score, um, I was still able to to go um, and study in Milan, a, a top university, which was amazing. Um, another reason like that I, I chose to go is uh, I really enjoy um, the company of European students, of international students. They all have stories to tell. They're all super interesting people. And um, I don't regret it one bit. I think it's one of the best experiences that I've had in my life coming here to Bocconi. 
Okay, thank you very much, Felix. And Zaim, of course, please tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from and what you're doing now. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Zaim. Uh, I come from the UK. I've studied in the UK my whole life. Um, I did my GCSEs at Kiwi Boys in Barnet, and then I moved for A-levels to Dr. Challenger's. So I went to grammar schools for my full education. Um, I mean, again, I, I applied to the UK and I applied to the US and I applied to, to economics um, wherever I applied. But um, I, I wanted to study abroad because I wanted to experience a new culture, obviously coming to a European um, university, I get to learn some new languages um, and kind of just push myself outside of my comfort zone. And then uh, kind of regarding why Bacconi specifically, I knew I wanted to go along the, the investment banking track. Um, and then from, from speaking to a lot of people in industry, I realized that Bocconi was a, a really top target university. And I found that recently, you know, since applying for internships, spring weeks, you know, about probably 50, 60 percent of my interviews have, have been from Bocconi. So I've seen the, the presence in the job market, especially within my main career interest. And then um, I guess I'm on international economics and finance, and I, I really wanted to have that quantitative feel of a degree and I felt like Bocconi gave that with my with my degree along with the flexibility as, as Mario said earlier of being able to choose either economics or finance to major in um, within the degree within the degree and then, and then finally again um, you know the partner universities I feel like the the exchange program at Bocconi was very unique uh, in terms of you know where you're able to go all across the globe so that's a little bit about why I chose to study abroad and, and why Bocconi a bit more specifically. Okay. Thanks, Aim. So now you've got a rough idea as to who our three student guests are and what their backgrounds are. And, you know, I think you'll find that they're broadly similar to a lot of you who are calling in to, to learn more about Bocconi today. Obviously, again, we're going to come back to them and ask them lots of questions about their individual experiences um, a little bit later on. But as I know from experience of doing these webinars, the vast majority of questions always seem to be around how on earth do I get in? And what, end, what are the entry requirements and things like that? When do I have to do what? And luckily, there is one person on this call who is ideally placed. She's the expert in all of this. So Elisa Ravelia from Bocconi is now going to talk to you all about that. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Yes, I'll try and walk you through uh, the admission process at Bocconi. I've seen already a few questions coming in, so I'll try and be uh, as specific as I can, and then we can go back to any of you, you know, curiosities or queries you might have afterwards. So I'll try and share my screen. Okay. You should be able to see it, I think. Great, perfect. Okay, so uh, admissions, there we go. The application process. Um, first of all, what do we consider when it comes to admissions? Well. Uh, I have to say, first thing first, the admission process of Bocconi takes into account mainly, um, let's say, analytical and quantitative elements. Uh, the first more, two most important elements are a test and your grades. The test, uh, you have different options here. So you can apply with a test that can be an SAT or an ACT, so an aptitude test that you uh, can use also to apply to other universities, or we have our own test, which is called Bocconi test. And it's a test that you can done online from the safety of your own home. And it is an analytical uh, test that has a part of questions in math and a part of questions in logic. It's multiple choice. Uh, it's a multiple choice question. Uh, test, sorry. You can choose which test uh, you want. So first question I always get, is it better to apply with one or the other? You should apply with the test in which you perform better. So there are no minimum scores that we can um, tell you that will assure you admission, so to say. Uh, but uh, as SAT is concerned, we usually suggest students to stay above 1,350 from that score up. This score does not guarantee you admission, but what it tells you is that if you start from that point, you, you know, you're already starting with the right foot. So uh, you're already a competitive applicant on that item. Uh, SAT, ACT is sorry from 28 to 29 up, but again, you can even apply with less because the test is not the only selection element. You see here on the slide, the test counts for the 55% in the application process, but that's not it. There's a second element that waits a lot in the application that are your, and those are your school transcripts. So your GPA from your second to last and third to last year of high school. 
Uh, if we're talking about British curriculum system, this would mean your GCSEs or IGCSEs and then your ASs level. If we're talking about the IB curriculum, for example, this would mean your middle year programs or GCSEs and then your IB01 grades. Uh, I think Felix mentioned in his introduction that he got some sort of uh, unconditional offer. And this leads us to why we do not ask you to your, for your final grades or for your predicted grades. This is actually because you apply before you have those and we evaluate you on how you performed during your high school years on the second and third last. So our offer is not tied to your final diploma score, even though, of course, you will need to, to get a full diploma and we will see in a bit which kind of requirement that entails. Uh, so test results, very important, as well as school transcript uh, that counts for nearly 43%. Then there are some additional elements that we consider when it comes to admission. One are language certificates. So if you do have some language certificates, uh, you find on our website the complete list of the ones that we accept. Those can count in your application and they can give you a sort of extra boost. And then CV and personal statement. Um, CV and personal statements are something that are taken into account, especially when you come to that gray area, maybe, you know, you're at the same level in the ranking of our applicant, then we look thoroughly at your CV, at your experiences, at your motivation. So anyways, put some effort in writing those. We want to know why you're applying to Bocconi, what you want to achieve by studying with us, and why should, you know, we pick you, what can you bring to class? So anything that can give us an idea of who you are uh, besides your grade and test result. When you apply to Bocconi, you can um, list up to four programs you're interested in. So with one application, you apply to four different programs, uh, and then you're admitted to one specific program. So again, one big difference you might find if, you know, if, for example, you're also thinking about the US, applying to the US, you're not admitted to the university in general, but you're admitted to a specific course in the university, so to a specific bachelor program. Uh, when can you apply? Well, we have three main application rounds. Again, Felix mentioned he applied in the early session, so during your, his junior year. Uh, the early session usually runs at the end of the AES's level year or IB1 year, so the uh, junior year for students. Um, and applications are processed during the summer and students get results in September, so the beginning of the last year of high school. If you're not ready to do that during your junior year, that's perfectly fine. Or maybe if you're in this session because you're already in your last year of high school and you're applying, uh, you're thinking of applying now, we have two upcoming rounds. One is the winter session, one is and the other one is the spring session. Uh, so um, you can apply whenever you want and you can reapply. So in case you're not admitted, you can uh, try again in the following round and it will be like we have never seen your, your application before. So you will not be disadvantaged in any way. Um, if you guys are thinking of applying for 2022 entry, so for September, you have two uh, rounds available, the winter and the spring session. The winter session is now open, closing in January, and the spring session is the last one. One suggestion I want to give you guys here already is if you're interested in Bocconi and you're thinking of applying for next September, do not wait until the spring session. That's what we call a residual round. So we have in that round, we have like 10, 15% of the places remaining available. So, you know, do your math, but it's usually better to start applying earlier and not wait until that one uh, as, you know, the main uh, application round. Okay, I was, uh, a bit about diploma requirements. I've seen a few questions already popping up in the, in the uh, Q&A before about uh, diplomas and subjects. Uh, so for the IB, we accept a full IB diploma. We do not accept IB certificates. There are no specific subjects that we uh, ask you to take in order to apply for our um, bachelor programs, uh, same with the A-levels, but let's say that we usually suggest students to, um, if they are taking quantitative subjects, so whether that is maths, econ, business, that usually helps not in terms of admission strictly, but in case you get admitted, then maybe Georgia, Zaim and Felix can build on this uh, to transition a bit more smoothly to the university subjects that we teach because they give you that kind of background that can be helpful when you start classes here in your first year. But uh, let's say academically speaking with the IB, you need the full IB diploma, so no certificates, and you need to uh, get you know, at least the diploma with 24. The usual student that gets to Bocconi has an IB average of 36, more or less, uh, from that up. A-levels, for uh, the Italian Ministry of Education, if you're doing the British curriculum, you need to graduate with at least three A-levels or three pre-use, um, up to you. Uh, no BTECs in this case, um, and there's no minimum grades you need to take in the A to, to get in the A-levels, but usually students who get to Bocconi tend to have all A's, maximum one B, 
that's the kind of, again, applicant that we tend to, to then have here on campus in September. Um, I'm not dwelling too much on the uh, US diploma. I don't know if we have many students with the, from the American diploma here, but again, uh, similar to the A-levels, you need to have three APs coupled with the American diploma. Okay, that's it. Before closing up, Mark, I put up here also a few information besides admission, you know, practical things about fees and funding uh, that I know are, you know, some of the questions that might come up. Um, so you find here the general fees for Bocconi. We Mario mentioned at the beginning, Bocconi is a private institution, so the fee is around 13,000 euros per year here. We have a lot of funding options. Bocconi has a very generous scholarship scheme. Nearly one every four students get some sort of financial aid here at Bocconi. And we have two different types of scholarships. Uh, the first type of scholarships are based on academic merit, so academic excellence. And for those one, you're automatically evaluated when you apply for a bachelor program. So you can be evaluated for a full scholarship, so 100% or 50% tuition waiver. And we award those scholarships to the top candidates based on the same elements we consider for admissions. You know if you got this kind of scholarship at the same time, you know if you got it admitted or not. So it's very convenient if you're also you know, making your choice based uh, on this element. Of course, we then have scholarships based on uh, needs, so on the family economic condition, and those one require an application um, after you know if you got admitted or not to the phone. I think that's it from my side. I'll mute myself and leave room for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Elisa. Um, looking at the questions that came in and just trying to go through them and group them all together before asking them to people, um, it does seem that the vast majority of them have just been answered. So all those questions about what grades do I need to get in? Basically, it's competitive, okay? Let's not say that this is easy, all right? But at the same time, you know, it's not that you need stupidly high grades to try. It's just that, you know, the end, in end effect, you know, the number of people who are successful is not that big. And uh, one thing that was very clear from Mario's presentation earlier, and maybe this is a question I'd like to ask both Mario and Elisa right now, you say you've had 50 odd percent more undergraduate applications this year. Has that had a noticeable impact on the entry requirements at this time? Are you seeing significantly higher SAT scores or more or less the same? Or, or has it had any changes yet? There's been an increase, of course, of the competitiveness because we, with such a big, a big number of additional applications, of course, you have more, uh, more possibilities. Uh, it really, as you said before, it really depends on many elements, on the rounds, on the, the courses you apply. With, for, we mentioned you apply up, uh, up to four, four degrees, four courses. So yes, we have seen an, an increase. Um, we face it very. We see it very difficult to give numbers because you know. Lisa mentioned something, but uh, you know it really depends. Uh, I I would give a try uh, anyway because you know everybody can get his its or her his or her chance. And as said, as as Elisa said, you have more chances. So if you are in your last year, you have a couple of chances. If you are in your second to last year, you have three three rounds, three chances. So uh, the earlier you apply, the better it is. Also because you wanna you know test yourself in case you get don't get in you have another possibility and retake the test or redo, represent an international, let's say, uh, test, uh, recognized as like the XAT or the ACT. So yes, it's a bit more competitive, of course, but, uh, you know, I would give it a try anyway. Okay. Well, obviously, we're not trying to stop people from applying, but it's like, you know, we want to be as realistic as we possibly can. Ab absolutely, absolutely. No, of course, this I, I forgot to mention, if you have an 1100 SAT or 1200 SAT, you don't have many chances to get in, even though your grades are very high, because, you know, as Elisa said, the, the, the test counts for the most, the most, the, the, the right. most part. So this is, this is, we have to say that. But, you know, if you have around 1300 plus 1350, you, you may compete. It's not given that you get in and it's not given that you don't get a place. Right, okay. And I do have one more question, which I know this is something perhaps, Elisa, you can answer this one. Um, we're gonna to come to the majority of the questions in a moment, but this first one is just, can you apply twice, for example, first in the early session and then again in the winter session? Absolutely, yeah, sure. Uh, you can do that, as I mentioned before, you can reapply. So in case you apply, you're not admitted, let's say you try in the early session, 
uh, you're not at the method and you want to reapply in the winter session, you can absolutely do that. Uh, you will have to redo the application from the start. So you can also choose different courses, for example, change the order of the courses you want. You could apply with a different SAT or ACT test. You could even choose a different test you want to apply with. So absolutely, if you're interested in Bocconi, uh, I would suggest starting applying earlier also for the re this reason, because, you know, you have more uh, chances to, to apply. So if you start uh, in your junior year, you can apply three times. So you have three chances, basically. I mean, I think from conversations we've had in the past, Elisa, it's not that your chances proportionately are any higher in the early and the regular window. It's just obviously if you do both sessions, that is going to increase your chances. Just yes. Doubling yes. The windows. yes, it does. Uh, I mean, in the early winter session, as I said before, there are more places available. So to be honest, it's it's not easier, but it, 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 there are more places in those two sessions. So it's harder, I would say, just in the spring round to, to get admitted. Uh, we, are, so that's, we are helping people apply. So we're coming up with a good strategy for them. Yes. The good strategy mm -hmm. is don't rely on the spring window. Yes. Okay? yes. But to it's be very there. honest. I mean, keep, just, keep that there. you know, as a backup. It's, it's fine as a backup in case, you know, you want to reapply, maybe you're waiting for your new SAT score and it has gone wonderfully well. So you want to reapply, that's perfect. But I would say don't keep it as your main application round because that could be a bit risky. Okay, thanks very much, Elisa. Obviously, I know there's a whole load more questions coming in about these kind of things of entry requirements. We will come back to this topic. Don't worry if we haven't already addressed your question, but rather than get completely sidelined by everybody's individual A-level predictions and A-level subjects, um, I would like to now turn back to Georgia, Zaim, and Felix. Um, and I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, largely about your student experience, and please feel free to pass, ch chip in anything that you've got to say. Um, but I am aware that all three of you, I believe, now are in your second year at the university, which means you really did arrive right in the middle of the pandemic. So I'd just like you all to share a little bit about your sort of first year experiences, perhaps in terms of the, the learning environment, accommodation and things like that. So anything you'd like to say about that? Um, I'm, I can start if you'd like. Yeah, please do. Um, so uh, one thing that I think Georgia and I have in common is um, we started our first year together in um, a residence in a student accommodation housing called Dubini. It's a 15 minute walk from campus. And um, these residences were completely open, completely provided for by the university. Um, we were never sent home. They were always you know, open. Uh, unlike I think in the UK, they closed some residences. And um, Bocconi did a great job in kind of supporting that. Um, and allowing us to kind of uh, still be able to socialize, still be able to meet people, obviously with masks and uh, in outdoor areas. But um, uh, Bocconi made it really easy for us to have a first, as much of a first year university experience as one could have. Um, for example, in the first year, we uh, had a hybrid mode whilst most of the UK universities were shut. So we could attend um, one week uh, online and one week in presence. Um, of course, with uh, the university checking whether you were actually in presence or online, so you couldn't really cheat the system, but um, it definitely helped getting to know some of your classmates. Associations still were open. They were still having meetings, albeit online, and um, they basically made the best of the situation in every way possible. Uh, I think, Georgia and Zaim, maybe you can elaborate on what I've said. No, I agree with everything you said. and. Um... Yeah, not only the residences were open, but also the actual physical campuses themselves. So uh, I was actually with Felix the moment we found out that the UK variant had occurred and that uh, flights were going to be cancelled. We were eating pizza by the by the Duomo. Um, and basically, my decision was actually to stay in Milan. And very last minute, the residents actually let me stay over the Christmas period because it was quite a, an unexpected change. Uh, my Christmas was not with my family, but with my Lebanese, Thai and Indian friends, which Again, unexpected, but uh, a great experience. And um, there was the exam season and every day we could go to the campus. You had the face masks, um, you had the uh, control of the passes and everything, but yeah, you did feel super secure, but also had the possibility to, to have much more of a university experience than um, in many other places. So, and Zayim, great. if you've got anything you'd like to say about, about this aspect of what university has been like so far? Uh, kind of completely agree with what the other two have said. Um, Bocconi definitely pushed trying to make the first year as normal as possible. I definitely felt that compared to my my UK friends who were locked up in in halls for the most part of the year, weren't really allowed to go home, had online lessons for the full year. But as soon as the situation allowed in Italy, you know, Bocconi were really quick to to pivot towards hybrid mode, and then 
we moved back to to 100 in person at the end of the year so that was that was really nice to see um i guess the only difference from uh from Felix and Georgia is that I had to find accommodation um, by myself. Um, but again, I found that really easy. And um, I was very lucky to find a place like a minute from the university. So, you know, even though I wasn't able to be in halls, I, I still found it really easy to, you know, be comfortable and, and have a new home in Milan. Did the university help you with that process to get the accommodation sorted? Uh, no, really. I mean, like, I had to do most of that myself, but they were very active in, in pushing halls, um, how to apply for them. Um, and then I guess uh, after we, I mean, if, if you didn't, if you weren't successful with halls, they provided links that you could go and apply to for different hostels around Milan. Um, but uh, I found a couple of friends who also wanted to, to stay with me. And then uh, we contacted a bunch of agencies across Milan and managed to find a nice apartment. Okay. And Felix, you want to come back in on this? Yeah, I just wanted to elaborate. Um... I mean, not all university students uh, kind of knew about this, especially, you know, when coming in, but um, there are a lot of uh, student based, you know, um, help pages, especially on uh, Facebook, on WhatsApp. And they're all like, uh, they all ask, uh, I'm looking for a roommate for this apartment, or we have an apartment that we're selling as a third years or that we're, uh, that we're kind of moving on the rent to, to the next batch of students. So um, there are definitely also those ways through kind of Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, groups to to find amazing roommates right okay thanks for that so i mean i think people from that the sense is you know luckily you had a pretty good first year at university unlike perhaps some people in the uk um so it's been as normal as it possibly could um but one thing that i regularly he hear or we regularly describe as quite often described and i believe is quite an accurate assessment of life at bagoni is that the workload is quite intense yeah so how have you found coping with the study um, what was the adjustment like from doing, you know, your A-levels or the IB to ending up at Bocconi? And how do you think that compared, if you've got any comparison with, you know, your friends who might have gone to a UK university? Zion, maybe if I come to you first on that one. Yeah, I guess I, I felt like it was quite similar, actually. Um, I think the biggest difference between Bocconi and UK universities is the amount of contact hours you get with uh, professors. So, I, um, I mean, a typical week for me is about 25, 27 hours of uh, contact with my lecturers, including, you know, TAs, um, stuff like that. So I found it quite similar in the sense that we covered a lot more material in class. Um, so it was still very rigorous. But then compared to my UK counterparts, I had to do kind of less reading outside, less explorative reading because mm -hmm. a lot more content was covered in class. I guess that was the main difference. But yeah, extremely rigorous. They keep you on your toes the whole time. You can't really let up in your... Uh, in your workload um but yeah that's that's how it was for me right and georgia anything yeah um i will say i'll compare it less to to british friends but for me i found the i'll be honest the jump from id to to university very hard um as i think i mean economic and social sciences is quite a quantitative course and i knew what i was getting myself into but i don't think to that extent um, and one thing i will say is also the italian education high school system is to a very high level so also your peers are uh, already used to you know studying very regularly for their exams and uh, are very very driven so it's very I mean it also puts you being in that environment it motivates you to to be that same level but um, it definitely might take some adjustment at the beginning but you do see the change. And I just want to say that there's a couple of times now this point about quantitative has come up, hasn't it? Um, and we've seen it a few a few of the questions of people asking, what subjects do I need? Do you need maths to get in? No. Do you need to have to be comfortable with maths? For nearly every degree there, I'm going to say yes. Maybe less so on the politics and government, but on most of the other degrees, there's a very hefty, you know, quantitative element to it. And that can occasionally be something particularly if you drop maths at GCSE that it takes a while to adjust to in our experience uh Felix anything you'd like to add on your first year of workload or how it's been I for mean you? to develop on 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 your point um I did standard level maths at IB and um definitely uh, even higher level maths it does not prepare you for the style and the 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 type of maths that they teach in university. Um, it's it's much more theoretical uh, for at least the first module, and then it applies to applied financial mathematics. So, in those senses, it's um, it's definitely a jump. Um, but that's what I really like about Bocconi is that 
I came from, uh, uh, you know, studying the IB and um, I kind of, you know, breezed through the, the two years doing my workload as it was due. And then when it came to exams, I barely really studied. But here I, I learned how do you study by yourself and how do you learn the things that you didn't really understand in class? Right. Okay. Thanks very much, Felix. So I think that gives you a sense that, you know, this is going to be a, a challenging yet exciting option. Um, the next questions that I want to address are almost elements of the Bocconi experience that don't happen at Bocconi. Now, Bocconi facilitates, but they happen elsewhere, namely exchanges and internships. We've had a question here, Mario. Perhaps I can come to you on this one. Um, maybe you can give us some concrete examples. What are opportunities for international exchange during the various degree programs? There are many opportunities that Zain mentioned in his, in his uh, first uh, talk. Uh, there are really many opportunities. This is one of the things that we value most and we are very proud of, meaning that we have opportunities basically all over the world, as I mentioned. I can share just one slide to give you an idea. Uh, this is the slide is not in the presentation of tonight, but it's another slide. So I think you can see it. Here we go. So this slide says that the, the quantity of opportunity is incredible. So we have over 280 uh, uh, or 286 uh, to be precise partner universities all over the world. We also also exchange it, but also join the double degree. So you can see here that we have partners all over the world and we have the best schools in the areas of social sciences. So if you go to the US, you have all the Ivy League programs. Uh, I give you a couple of examples that it gives you the idea. The Princeton Department of Economics and the Wood Wilson School of uh, Politics, uh, Politics Studies, I think it's called. Uh, they only have Bocconi uh, as a partner, the D Department of Economics, and I think the Wood Wilson School of Politics uh, as Bocconi and Oxford as a partner. So uh, they only have Bocconi as a partner for the exchanges. And we do send to Princeton in a normal year around 20, 20 students and receive 20 students because the exchanges are made on based on reciprocity. So I send as many students as many as I receive. So if you send me one student, send one student. If you send me 10 students, I send you 10 students. And can you imagine, we can send 10 students, to 20 students to Princeton because they have the interest in coming to Bocconi. So this is a real uh, added value. Another example is the Wharton School in University of Pennsylvania, the top business schools in the world, I would say. Uh, we have been for 10 years and we are currently number one destination for their exchanges in the world. So we exchange around 25 students in a given year. Why is an added value? Because you have the chance to go in a top school and you do both the, let's say, academic experience, very good academic experience, and the real, let's say, life experience uh, abroad. And at the same time, these students come to our place, to our university, to our courses, and are added value to the classes, especially in the classes of the second and third year mainly, uh, so the last year. So this is this is a real added value. Uh, so yes, this is this is one of our key, let's say, uh, uh, points and and uh, quality and speaks of the quality of the university. And the next question was about internships as well. The specific question is. Could you tell me if you offer internships in Italy or also overseas? Obviously, I already know the answer to that, but Elisa or Mario, if you'd like to say something, I mean, the answer is yes, basically, isn't it? <laughs> yes, to be more precise, 16% uh, of our internships were offered uh, overseas. So yes, mainly Italy, mainly Europe, of course, uh, but we have also a very, very, very good number of opportunities also also abroad uh, outside Italy. So yes, there are lots of opportunities. Consider that Milano, uh, you may not be familiar with, uh, let's say, job opportunities in Italy. I may think that Italy is not a place with incredible number of job opportunities, maybe less than UK. And that may be true if you consider all Italy. But if you consider the Lombardy region, the, the region which is the engine of the Italian economy where Bocconi is based, and the city of Milan, which is the business capital of, of, of Italy, that is, uh, we have quite different data. Uh, I mentioned before the placement of our students. Um, I have to say that we have 4,700 multinational companies based in Milano in the Lombardy region. If you think about any multinational company who decides, which decides to open up a branch in Italy, that would be in our area. So opportunities are there. So it may be true that you, can, you may work in, in Milano or in Italy, 
but you work for in, in an international environment for an international company. So lots, plenty of opportunity. Zain mentioned, of course, when you talk about finance, when you talk about London, we have plenty of, of opportunities because you know investment banks and banks in London do appreciate our our the quality of our students and the preparation of our students and want them. So you have really plenty of opportunities. To give you an idea, I, we were I was with a with a colleague a couple of weeks ago at the end of November of uh, October in in London and we participated to an alumni event. And we had we had thousands of events of alumni in London, and on that single event, it was a, a, like a, a, we call it aperitivo, like a, a night out. It was uh, 100, 100 participants, so 100 young alumni, all in the 25, 35 age range, and uh, most of them working in finance, but not only finance. So very, very good opportunities, not only in Italy but also abroad, and also of course in the UK. Right. So good. And I would just like to ask our three students on this very point. Uh, you're all in the first semester of your second year, which I guess means that choosing to go on an exchange or where you're going to do an internship are kind of live issues for you. Um, have you given any thought to where you're going to go on exchange or where you'd, where you'd like to go on exchange or anything like that or where you'd like to do an internship? Uh, maybe, Georgia, if you want to go first on that one. Yeah, so um, with me, I mean, I like the opportunity that these are all options available. Um, in theory, I think Felix maybe can talk about it as well. You can start your um, internship from the summer of the first year, although most people usually do it in the summer of the second year or in the third year. Um, I haven't done any yet, but I'm currently looking in the consulting sector um, or the social sector um, more for this summer. In terms of intern, uh, sorry, of exchange, um, the nice thing about the economic and social science course is that there are some reserved spots specifically for um, that bachelor. Um, exchanges are quite competitive to, to sign up for, but it means that you have um, an additional uh, yeah, opportunity to try to go abroad. And uh, I think for me personally, it's still early days to, to look into it, but I'm, I'm definitely looking for the opportunity. Right. And Zaim, you mentioned internships earlier on. I guess this is a, a large part of what's attracted you to Bocconi in the first place. So has it lived up to its expectation or your expectation, shall we say? Yeah, well, definitely. I mentioned that um, well, the investment banking track has you know, very, uh, like a very specific pathway. So, I mean, I got two spring weeks last year. Um, I mean, like both of my interviewers were Bocconi and they definitely were a little bit more, more warm to me during the interview because I, I was part of Bocconi. But... Definitely, even even this year, you know, I'm applying for for investment banking roles for next summer. Um, so I've, yeah, I've gone pretty hard on that about 45, 50 applications, and yeah, I mean, I'm waiting to hear back from some final rounds now. But also also exchange as well. Um, I think because I'm going to go with the the economics major, I'm going to be competing with with Georgia for the um, for the reserve spots for for some of those schools. So I'm hoping to get to end up at an Ivy, but it's it's still early days and I just kind of need to focus on keeping my, my GPA up at the moment because it's, it's really competitive. Yeah, that's one thing that's often overlooked with exchanges, particularly when people look at universities and they see what fantastic opportunities there are there. But as Mario has already pointed out, exchanges are based on the principle that same number go out as come in. So the fact that a university has an exchange with Harvard or USC or whatever is lovely to know. But if it only affects two students a year, yeah, you're going to have to work pretty hard to get those options. Um, Felix, anything you could tell us about what your plans are around internships or exchanges? Um, yeah, so uh, I already, as Georgia mentioned, did my um, an internship in my first summer. Um, an internship also counts towards a credit requirement, which allows you to not do an elective in your third year, which makes your workload a little bit easier. So that was partly a reason I just wanted to get it out of the way. Um, but it was also a really valuable experience and, and Bocconi obviously helped me. Um, but with regards to... Um, exchanges uh i have a less let's say competitive approach uh with regards to georgia and zaim um i really want to take it as a as more of a cultural experience if i end up doing an exchange um so i was thinking of perhaps applying to an asian university and see what life is like um in an asian country because i 
potentially want to work in one of the one of the Asian mega cities for a couple of years. Um, but uh, in the end, I'm already studying in Milan, so it basically is an internship, uh, an exchange for myself. So I wouldn't be bummed if I if I could uh, continue to study for another year in in Milan uh, or for a semester, sorry, in my third year in Milan. Mark, if I may add uh, on this, no, I, I, I to to make it clear, uh, we have lots of opportunities. So of course, if you want to go to Princeton, you need to have a, a, an A A minus <laughs> GPA, something like that, because the competition is there. But if you want to go to Asia, as Felix mentioned, or Latin America, or other places, or even in the US, to give an idea, we have for the undergraduate program only. We used to, we usually have now this year. I, I don't know because the the num, the the, 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 the is not the offer is not out yet. But I think it's it's usually about 1,600 places only for the undergraduates. So the number of applicants uh, and the number of places are quite matchable. There are not so many students who are out from the program, and you and you can choose up to ten choices. So you can put in the first choice that is your preferred one, and then you go up to, to 10. So of course, if you want to be a bit more flexible about that, and you say, OK, it's not only about Columbia or LSE or whatever, but it can be also a live experience, then the GPA is not that uh, very relevant, of course. Yeah. Uh, more competition in, in some places than others. That's no, I mean, there, there is a significant amount of Ivy League fixation, which I fight against a tremendous amount as well. I mean, obviously, we see the appeal of them, and an exchange is an affordable, sensible way to go about it. But these are not the only universities in the world. And actually, building on what Felix said, and Mario, building on one of your previous Bocconi Meets London events, which I was able to attend in person, a Bocconian did absolutely, I believe it's somebody who works for Shell now, did actually say that if you don't have Asia on your CV at some point, and you're looking to get to the top in business in the 21st century, that is something you are missing a lack, there's a lack there. So absolutely, I think Felix, the plan you've got there is pretty smart. And certainly, I would encourage people to be plenty, be really adventurous in your choices. It's like it, the flexibility is there to do all sorts of weird and wonderful, exciting things. And you're possibly not going to get these opportunities later in life, let's put it that way. Um, talking about later in life, I've got one final set of questions I want to ask George, Zaim and Felix, and then we will mop up everything else that's still outstanding in the Q&A with everybody else. You are in the middle of a bachelor's degree right now, so it's possibly a little bit unfair of me to ask you where you're going to go next. Um, but do you have an idea as to what your plans are in terms of master's degree with Bocconi elsewhere, or job market, job, what kind of roles you're hoping to, to go for? And uh, Felix, we'll come to you first on this one. Um, all right, so I would start off by saying, from my experience so far with Bocconi, it's had definitely its ups and its downs, but its ups have just been absolutely amazing. So I would love to continue with a master's here in Bocconi. Um, I definitely want to do a master's uh, straight after university because at the moment, you know, it gives you a bit of a buffer zone after the whole, you know, economic downturn that we're currently in with, with COVID. Um, and it also is a really valuable experience. It kind of after my internship, I saw I really wanted a few more years to spend with people my age group. Um, what you really don't see is, you know, you want to go into the job market, you say, um, I want to start working on start earning my own money. But um, in the end, it's these these last years that you get with to spend with people that are your age. So um, I definitely do want to do a master's potentially in in finance, um, just because it's very applicable. It's very interesting. Um, and I would love to do a Bocconi, but I wouldn't be um, against applying to, let's say, uh, top universities in the UK or in uh, in in America or in Asia um, for a one or two year masters. Okay, and Zayim, same question to you. Uh, I'm a little bit different. I think I want to go straight into work after my my bachelor's. Um, I think partly because I've said I was on the investment banking track, so they offer a lot of graduate roles. Um, and you know, I think it's probably a great opportunity to start, you know, diversifying my skill set extremely early on. Um, so, yeah, the plan is probably two years in investment banking, move into something which is going to, you know, have a little bit of a less, less of a workload. Um, I don't really want to be working like 100 hour weeks for, for five, 10 years into the future. And then I think, I mean, my plan is to probably pivot into something else within finance or corporate development and use um, a master's five, six years along the line from now, maybe an MBA to, to try and do that. Um, so yeah, that's my plan. 
Okay, and Georgia? Mine is still uh, quite broad. I think my end goal, uh, and maybe half a lifetime from now, is working in education um, in some form. Whereas for now, I'm quite interested in um, also being like Zayim and um, sitting out of education for a few years. Uh, one thing we didn't really touch upon, but Bocconi has a lot of associations um, that I've been part of a few, and through there, um, I have a lot of I mean older students that ended up finishing their bachelor or their masters and getting job offers um, abroad and just hearing their experiences has been quite motivating. Um, and also even in Milan, like Mario said, there's, there is a lot of opportunity. We didn't speak about the city, but it's it's a beautiful, full of opportunities, both cultural and in terms of work. So um, yeah, very open to, <laughs> to explore. You're right. We haven't really touched on Italy as a fantastic place to live at all, have we? But I think you're all pretty good adverts for that. Um, but there was one question that came in specifically about this, uh, about what are student successes with masters in America after bachelors? I mean, that's a kind of how long is a piece of string question, isn't it? Um, but I would say that if you're thinking you can do your three years at Bocconi and then go on to a leading university in the US to do a master's degree, I can't think of a single reason why that would be a bad plan. Anybody? So I'm pretty sure that's going to work out for you. Let's put it. Well, I can I can add. No, that's absolutely a plan. Uh, you can do that. Of course, masters, pre-experienced masters in the US are less common than in Europe. So you you don't find that offer that you find all over Europe. Uh, I give you just one one last statistics in the uh, talking about master and then PhD in the top PhDs in the US in economics. The major uh, Bocconi was ranked number three in terms of. Uh, you know, student accepted in the PhD, like it was after Chicago and Harvard and in front of Oxford and let's see, I think. So it was really, so it's very much possible because the people in the, in the education know about Bocconi and the, the you know, the, 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 the faculty members, the academia know, knows about Bocconi and the bachelor here is very much valued uh, by, by, by universities all over the world. So yeah, I think you're you're on a good track, and you know you're not you're certainly not ruling anything out by that. So yes, that's good. Um, there's one. There's a, only a handful of open questions right now. This next one, I'm pretty sure, is going to end up with Elisa. It's around A level subject requirements. STEM subjects are recommended. Is this also true for the international politics and government? Students who are interested in that kind of degree are more likely doing history, politics, modern foreign languages, for example. So would those be sensible choices or? Yeah, I mean, they, they are, as I said, there are no requirements when it comes to admission. So the fact that you have not done maybe economics or business yet, you know, for A-levels would not have an impact on your chances of being admitted. Um, even though our politics course has a strong accent on economics. So uh, my advice would be, it's perfectly fine, but if you start studying politics at Bocconi, uh, you might want to, anyways, take into account that there will be some maths and numbers and some economics involved. Now, maths, uh, economics and politics are very much intertwined. So the courses that we teach tend to also, you know, focus on that. So uh, you don't know there is no prerequisite, but you might want to take into account that that is going to be something that you will study early, you know, on when you start university. Uh, but I would say, do not panic. I mean, there are plenty of students that come, for example, from the Italian system where economics is not taught in all high schools. It depends on the type of curriculum that you have. So when you start university here, we really start from scratch. So even though you haven't gone through those subjects at high school level, do not panic. There will be, uh, you know, support here and you will be taught uh, from day one uh, in order to get the basics and the pillars also in economics in case you haven't touched on that before. I mean, I have to say, Bocconi webinars are probably the hours of my life where the word quantity <laughs> is used the most. Okay? I know, I know. <laughs> okay, uh, it's there. It's a fact of life. Uh, this next question, Elisa, is also for you. Um, how do you decide which program we get admitted to out of the four we can apply for? It's straightforward. You, the student sets the ranking, don't they? The, the yes, choices? yes. Uh, but that's actually a great question because it allows me to maybe give one last suggestion to students. So. Um, a lot of the time I get asked, how do I need to rank the courses, you know, the full courses? Should I rank uh, the most popular first or the one I like most first? Well, the answer is rank them in your order of preference, really. So the first one has to be the course you like most, and then you can rank three others. Why is it so? Because the admission ranking is one only ranking for all students. When your turn comes in the ranking, we evaluate you for the, your first preference. 
If there's still space in that course, you are admitted to that program. If not, we go to your second, your third or your fourth. So that's how we do it. Uh, this is also the reason why we suggest students in case you have more than one interest to maybe put more than one course in your application because this allows us to evaluate you for more than one program. Um, I think we have students here from the finance course, uh, but also the management course shares basically the first year and a half with the economics and finance one. So again, an alternative could be put those two courses and then maybe, you know, see if you want to transfer from one or the other or still, you know, they share uh, basically the first three semesters. So there's not so much of a difference uh, for, between those. So again, uh, that could be something you might want to take into account if you're really interested in Bocconi. Okay. All right. Quick uh, flip that to sort of three students here. Did you get into your first choice courses? Maybe you just nod or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these three were all successful with their first choices. Okay. That's good to hear. Um, the next question I've got here is about accommodation. I think we've more or less covered this. Is accommodation guaranteed in the first year uh, or throughout the whole time? Certainly not throughout the whole time. And in the first no. year, it's um, first come, first served, isn't it? Yes, so it's not guaranteed being that you need to apply for housing. There is a housing application that opens up every um, spring, every May, usually the beginning of May. You need to apply as soon as the application opens up and then you can rank your preference among the different types of dorms and rooms and you can be assigned one of the rooms. Uh, we try and give precedence to first year overseas international students, but of course we don't have space for everybody, so we try and do that. Um, you don't get the, the housing for the three years. Why is it so? Because students don't stay for three years in Milan, as you have seen with, you know, uh, hearing maybe Georgia Zaim and Felix plans, they tend to, in the third year, go abroad either for an internship or for an exchange program. So it doesn't make much sense to give the student the room for three years. So what happens is if you lend a room in the dorms, then you have it for the first two years. Uh, that's usually what, what, what happens. Some students maybe after one year decide they want to move out because they met friends and they'd rather leave off campus and share apartments. Uh, so that is something again that, that happens pretty pretty often. But that's the usually time the usual time frame. So apply application in May, and you usually know if you got the room at the beginning of summer. Right. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, you'll be thrilled to learn all the remaining questions are also for you. Um, we're coming to nearly the end now, so please, if there's anything super urgent that you haven't asked, put it in now, because I'm going to stop as soon as these two questions are, are done. Uh, first one relates to when can you first apply for enrolment in 2023? That would be a uh, next early session that's going to open up, I guess, in May 2022. So you will be able to apply in May, June 2022. We will evaluate your application during summer and you will get the results in September 2022. And you will know as early as then if you have got a spot for September 2023. Okay, so yeah, you can get working on this right after you've finished your, well, concurrently with the end of your first year of your A-levels or IB. Uh, and the final question is one I'm not sure that you will have an answer to. Are there statistics for acceptance rates on various degrees or? I don't know, Mario, if you want to take this one. It's basically very difficult because you can put up to four choices. So basically, it's it's not it's not possible. Uh, we have statistics, of course, but what we say and what is the the, the average? It's about one out of six. Uh, the ratio, so fifteen percent, round out something like that. depends on the year, but it's really something like that. Uh, of course, it depends on the round, on the courses. If a student puts only one course instead of four, I have less chances because there are less places. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it really depends. But one out of six, it's a, it's a good proxy. Uh, this is this year used to be one out of five, I would say. So this year with the increase of, of applications, that's, that's the, right. the ratio. I, I, I don't like these kind of questions for the simple reason that it's got everything to do with you as an individual and nothing to do with the other people who apply. And if in one year, 10,000 rubbish candidates suddenly arrive, all of these numbers are now junk. So, you know, absolutely, absolutely. You're so right. you have to be very, very careful that you've had an answer to that question. It's told you nothing about your own individual chances. OK. Um, one question that hasn't come up that we should have addressed, really, uh, deferring by a year, uh, taking deferred entry, Elisa. Uh, 
that is not possible. So we don't do deferrals. So you need to apply uh, with a specific timeline in mind. So as I said, if you apply now in the winter and spring session is for September 22 entry. And if you want to apply for 2023, then you will have to wait for the early session. Uh, but we don't do deferrals. So you need to pick your time wisely. This is simply because you're competing against the people applying for the year you want to go to university, not yes. some pretend people from the following year who might be better and then you might, you know, not get in. So, but, so yes, yeah, so that's just the way it is. Actually, at least one question I want to ask you, because I wasn't entirely sure of the answer to this one myself, okay. is if students are applying in a gap year, they will have their final year of high school results, won't they? So you mentioned earlier, you take into consideration the third and second year, can you take their final year into consideration or does that make it too unequal? It, it would make it unequal. So we won't do that. So we will we evaluate all candidates on the same element. So even though you're taking the gap here and you decide to apply that one, we will not look at your final uh, diploma score to be fair, uh, you know, with all the other applicants. Uh, so that that's usually how it works. Right. And one final question, which I will just tackle. Uh, can we do we apply through UCAS? I think we covered this now. <laughs> not at all. UCAS is completely. No, we don't. I usually start saying that how, how you apply to Bocconi, you do not apply for UCAS. I forgot to do it this time. <laughs> uh -huh. But it's actually true. So uh, even maybe some of you, uh, if you're thinking about applying to different universities in Italy, one thing you have to keep in mind that is that in Italy, we do not have a system such as UCAS or the Common App in the US. So if you're interested in Italian universities, you have to apply to the specific university itself. Um, so you have to go and ask them how that works. And also the timeline can be different. Bocconi has a different timeline than uh, the universities in Italy or in Europe in general. So, you know, you cannot do that. We have only one program through which you can apply through Common App, which is the Wood Bachelor in Business that we did not mention before. I mean, Mario uh, mentioned uh, the content of the program. That is the only one uh, that you need to apply through Common App, but it's because you apply through USC, not through Bocconi. But for the rest, it's on our application portal. And it's always the thing that you leave out that people ask about, isn't it? So that's good. Okay, right. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've had a great number of questions. Hopefully you've learned a lot more in the last hour and a quarter, so you know that Bocconi is definitely going to be right for you. Um, I'm going to now just invite our three students, Georgia, Zaim, and Felix. If you'd like to say, you know, say anything to people just like you, a couple of years younger to you, do you have any final message you would like to leave them with regarding Bocconi? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll just say one thing. Uh, I applied to Bocconi and um, one person was supposed to come with me to go to Bocconi. In the end, nobody that I knew came to Bocconi with me. And I'll tell you, um, it's a shot in the dark, definitely. There aren't, like, I mean, it, it's only 5,000 undergraduates pretty much that uh, end up going every year, of which 2,500 international students. The chance you'll have a friend going there is is very slim. But honestly, you make friends within, like, with an instant. Um, I met Georgia on the first day that I pretty much came to Milan. So um, it's lovely. Uh, even if, you know, it's it looks like a shot in the dark, I'd suggest just go for it. Okay. And Zayim, shall we come to you next? Yeah, pretty much the same thing, like uh, be prepared to be uncomfortable as well. It's a new environment. It's a new culture. Um, obviously, the, I don't know, Brexit obviously makes things a little bit more difficult now for British students coming to, to Italy. But yeah, it does push you out of your comfort zone. But if you're if you're willing to tackle that and you're willing to kind of overcome your fear of being in a completely new environment, then yeah, Bocconi is, is definitely the place for you as well. And before I get to Georgia, Zayim did bring up the B word there. Um, another one I've been avoiding mentioning. Uh, it makes absolutely zero difference to your chances of success in terms of getting in at Bocconi. It makes a little bit of difference to some of the practicalities around visas. Um, these are things that Bocconi can deal with. So don't worry about that at all. Sorry about that, Georgia. Now it's all yours. <laughs> No, no problem. I would echo what Zayim and Felix said. Uh, on a more practical note, uh, which is how I got to know Felix so quickly, if you decide to study abroad, remember to bring an adapter for the country you're going to live in. My mistake. Um, but on a more, I mean, general level, I think for me, outside of the actual subject I was studying, was thinking what it would be like being in a British uh, university as a British student or in an international university as an international student. And I think they offer very different experiences. So like Zayim and Felix were saying, it's 
about being outside of your comfort zone and being exposed to a lot of different um, nationalities in a country where you might need to learn the language um, if you're not familiar with Italian, but from uh, my experience, and I think the others, it's definitely been worth it. Great, thank you very much, Georgia, Zaim, and Felix. And on behalf of Bocconi, I'd like to ask uh, Elisa, and, well, and Mario, if there's any closing remarks you'd like to make. No, I mean, I think for me, having here Georgia, Zaim, and Felix, it's, you know, uh, I think they are already an example of the community you can find at Bocconi, which I think is one of the best things about our university, very diverse uh, students with different interests, with different, you know, uh, future goals. So if this is the environment you guys want to study in, I would say, you know, take this leap of faith, try, you know, get out of your comfort zone, and I think you'll be happy with it. So that's my only suggestion. And Elisa is absolutely the person to help you with all of that at any point. And I'll make sure you've got her contact details in the email we send out uh, tomorrow to follow up from this session. Mario, last word goes to you. Thank you. I copy what Elisa just said. So really an international environment, lots of possibilities, lots of options, uh, uh, really something to challenging, as Zaim said, as everybody said here, but really rewarding at the end of the day. So you are welcome. And uh, me, Elisa, of course, are, are available for anything you may need. From now on, of course, Mark, uh, thank you. Thanks to you for organizing this. And thanks to all the participants. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And good night. Good evening, anyway. Okay.